Hi everyone, uh, welcome back from your break. Um, this is the uh, last session of uh, this conference. Um, I'm Aidan Harper, I'm a researcher at the New Economics Foundation, um, which is based in the UK. Uh, my research focuses on the world of work with a specific focus on working time reduction. Uh, I also write the working time newsletter for the European Network for the Fair Sharing of Working Time. Please do sign up to the newsletter if you haven't already. Um, and please do contact me if you have any stories of working time reduction from your country that you think should be shared in the newsletter. Um, a reminder for this webinar, if you want to ask any questions at all to our panelists, please do click on the Q&A box, which you can find if you move your, your arrow to the bottom of the screen, you should be able to see a box there um, and type in any questions that we'll ask to the speakers um, at the end of all the presentations. Uh, well, we'll have a Q&A session. Um, we've had some great discussions at the conference so far, discussing in detail the need for a Green New Deal and a reduction in working time. However, uh, as someone once said, the philosophers have only interpreted the world. The point, however, is to change it. In this session, we have some brilliant speakers from all over the world in a range of campaigns and trade union organisations who are turning words to action and are organizing for the changes we hope to achieve as a movement. Um, I am pleased to introduce to you uh, Esther Lynch, the Deputy General Secretary um, for the European Trade Union Confederation, Sean Sweeney from the Trade Unions for Energy Democracy, Katharina Stiel from Students for Future in Germany, and Rachel White from the Four Day Week campaign in the UK. Um, I think we'll uh, begin with uh, Rachel today. Um, Rachel, you want to introduce yourself and uh, begin your presentation? Um, hi, everyone. Um, I am, yeah, as Aidan said, my name is Rachel. I'm a member of the Four Day Week campaign, um, which is a campaign that's been running for about four years, and I've been involved for three of those four years. Um, I'm going to talk today a little bit about the campaign and kind of like how we run on a kind of day to day level, um, a little bit about the kind of context of um, moving towards a shorter working week in the UK and kind of where our campaign fits within that. Um, and also just a bit of reflection on when we, where we as a campaign have been effective um, and where we kind of um, haven't been so effective and, and kind of what we're going to be focusing on in the future. Um, so yeah, I got involved um, in the campaign just from a kind of general interest in work and in workplaces and unions. I've always thought it's kind of crazy that we spend um, the majority of our working hours at work, but never, sorry, of our waking hours at work, but kind of don't think of it as something kind of political and kind of never really think about it critically, um, or the majority of people don't. And so I kind of saw the four day week um, campaign and getting involved in that as a way to kind of start to interrogate some of the, the kind of um, ideas um, around changing the world of work. Um, so the campaign is formed of roughly 10 people, um, all um, up until this year volunteers, people who've kind of just got a general interest um, in, in kind of uh, moving towards a shorter working week. Um, some people who've done a bit more kind of like have studied at a university or like kind of written papers on it at a university. So have a bit more kind of deeper knowledge um, about it too. Um, we meet monthly um, and we work, have worked in the past or, or kind of have close working relationships with um, New Economics Foundation um, and also with Autonomy, um, who are a think tank who um, mostly look at um, kind of uh, shorter working week um, kind of uh, yeah ideas around how we could move to a shorter working week. Um, in conjunction with NEF and Autonomy we've done things like write reports and do research um, and kind of joint press releases um, but kind of our role um, as a kind of smaller campaign um, that's had very little funding um, has meant that we are able to um, be a bit more political often um, or kind of take potentially slightly more radical um, positions and we're able to be a bit more kind of um, fun on our social media um, and kind of uh, yeah be a bit more agile with how we how we respond to things. Um, it's a really ca great campaign to be involved with um, as we're small there's a lot of chance to shape 
how um, how we want to do things and some really inventive ideas have come through from, from that. And yeah, as I mentioned, up until this year, we were all volunteers, um, but we've now been given a bit of funding um, and have an employee, um, a kind of a campaign coordinator who's um, kind of, uh, which has been really great because we've been able to work at a much kind of quicker pace and respond um, to things much quicker, which I think is really important at the moment because of all the changes that are kind of happening um, to both the economy and the world of work um, at the moment. So to touch a bit on kind of the UK context, um, like many places, the UK has a culture of really long working hours. Um, we also have a very weak trade union culture uh, used to be very strong until it was smashed to pieces in the 1980s. Um, I would say that there's been a bit of kind of revitalization of, of unions over the last couple of years. Um, uh, and unions who've been doing like really interesting and much more radical things um, than, than kind of in the years previously. But still the majority of, you know, of the workforce in the UK is not unionized. So I wouldn't say that, yeah. Um, there's still kind of challenges there. Um, quite a few unions in the UK have passed motions um, around moving to a short working week and a couple of them um, kind of have it in their negotiation with employers as to like um, to have the shorter working week as something that they um, are moving towards. So the Communication Workers Union, which is the um, uh, unionizes postal workers, um, Unite, which is a kind of generalist union, um, I think particularly the bus drivers in Unite are quite strong and moving towards a shorter working week. Um, RMT, which is the train workers union. So quite a few unions um, do have it as a demand, but it's not, I would say it's not super common. Um, it's not a very common demand from union members right now, kind of like widespread. Um, though unions are looking very closely at kind of Ige Metal for inspiration as to as to how to get that big union support for um, or kind of big union member support for moving to shorter working week. Um, as a campaign, I would say our barriers have been twofold. So um, I think um, though this did change over the last four years, the kind of lack of political will to actually um, to, to, to move to a shorter working week, um, people thinking that it was kind of unrealistic or, or wouldn't be popular. And uh, secondly, the kind of public, lack of public understanding as to, as to how a four day week would work um, and the kind of lack of just like knowledge of, of the idea itself. Um, and I think a kind of good example of how um, this played out is how the NHS is often used as an example of how the uh, a four day week couldn't work. So um, I'm sure many people will know that the NHS is, um, is the public health system in the UK and it's very dear to people's hearts. And I think it um, manages to pull a lot of, of, of heartstrings and arguments um, in, this, in this country. And uh, the kind of common, um, uh, common refute to saying we should have a four day week is that if, if we, um, have to employ more, if the NHS moved to a four day week, they'd have to employ more doctors and nurses, which would cost uh, billions for the country and it's completely unaffordable. Now, of course, there are lots of ways that we can come back to this, you know, obviously it doesn't take into account increased productivity, fewer sick days, etc. Um, and kind of the kind of more holistic impact of, of moving to a shorter working week. But it, it kind of shows how messaging can be really difficult because unsurprisingly, it takes more than one sentence to explain how um, a four day week would work for the entire UK economy. Um, and that doesn't really necessarily work in sound bites for the media. So you've got to, so overcoming this kind of um, people's kind of initial reaction to, you know, what moving to a four day week would mean was, has been um, a bit of a challenge for us or is something that we've kind of tried to take on um, head on. So we've kind of tried to put the issue on the map consistently by talking about it um, through kind of tweets, social media, press releases. Um, we made a video, which um, the aim of which was to kind of um, answer some of those common, um, sorry, I'm seeing something about native speakers. Is that someone telling me I need to slow down? Yes, apologies. Um, so, uh, sorry. 
Um, yeah, so we made a um, video, something that could be easily shared on social media, the idea of which was to um, be able to um, come back to or answer some of those those kind of trickier questions what would it mean for the nhs or what would it mean for people who don't work a five-day week now um, and answer those in a kind of quick and easy and shareable format so that um to kind of increase uh public perception sorry imp increase public knowledge of like of the idea and kind of show how it could work in practice um, we also did longer form things such as um, a report in conjunction with Autonomy and uh, the New Economics Foundation, um, which had just kind of really good research as to why the four day week is um, a good thing, but also um, showing how it could be achieved. Um, and through this work, we've got the attention of public, the public and of politicians. And it's kind of through this that we were able to um, move the Labour Party's position on a four day week. So at uh, the party conference, the Labour Party conference last year, um, the Labour Party made a commitment to um, move the UK to a four day week um, and to put that in the Labour manifesto. So the exact proposal was that the Labour government would reduce the working, uh, the average working week in the UK to 32 hours over the next 10 years. So not an overnight change, um, but something that would reduce hours as productivity increased. Um, sadly, Labour didn't make it into government um, or isn't, um, yeah, didn't form the government um in the last election in fact they lost seats um and so kind of they're in a weaker position than they were before um but there has been renewed interest in the four-day week this year as um a way to recover from the economic shocks of coronavirus um as a campaign we're regularly doing research that shows that um businesses and the public supports um a move to shorter a move to a shorter working week and we also have MPs, um, we're working closely with MPs who are tabling deb debates on it um, in Parliament too, to ramp up or keep the public, sorry, the parliamentary pressure on the issue. Um, also, some of the measures that are being introduced by um, the Conservative government to kind of make sure that um, there isn't huge unemployment and uh, lots of job losses um, are promoting uh, a shorter working week for the same or slightly reduced pay. Um, this mirrors closely what has been suggested by some think tanks in the past as a way to move um, countries to a, to a four day week or a shorter working week um, by government um, funding or kind of prop, uh, paying some, some wages for a period of time. Um, and, you know, this is kind of a bit of an unexpected outcome of, of uh, coronavirus and it's not necessarily the way that we would have wanted to move to a shorter working week but we're keeping um, a close eye on how these policies play out um, and see um, seeing how they can help us make the argument that um, yeah a wide, widespread um, shorter working week is possible and can help the economy recover. Um, so um, I'm now just going to reflect a bit on, on the work that we've done. So I think the campaign has been really effective at getting um, this issue on the left agenda. It's kind of widely understood to be an achievable goal now um, by most, I would say, most people on the left. And the Labour manifesto is potentially the best um, example of how we've shifted, shifted the debate on this. I think it's gone from something that seemed to be idealistic to something that many people think that we should be working towards. Um, I think the campaign has potentially struggled to get wider interest from, uh, sorry, to get interest from a wider range of MPs and business leaders. Um, so, you know, in the last three years, um, we, you know, that was mainly because of, um, I think, well, I would say it's because of strategic decisions that we made. So we made the decision to focus a lot of time and energy into um, getting the Labour Party to support our proposals because, um, yeah, it, it seems like um, 
Jeremy Corbyn could potentially become prime minister and Labour also had more power in government. Um, obviously the landscape has changed now and I think we're, well, I, I don't think we're, we're looking at other avenues that we can kind of put, um, use to put pressure on, uh, on government and also other ways that we can push this forward in this country. So kind of namely um, through, through, through unions um, and through other organizations who have a lot of um, power. And um, I would say a kind of another, yeah, this kind of um, plays into the fact that something that we haven't put a lot of energy into is this kind of, well, we have put some energy into kind of getting widespread support for um, a four day week, but I think that hasn't yet translated into um, people actually demanding it themselves in their workplaces. So people are very supportive of the idea of working less. Um, but it's not something that people are going into pay negotiations or negotiations with their employer and demanding en masse yet. And I think that there's real scope for us to be um, over the next, uh, well, especially over the next kind of few months, years, um, when the world of work is so uncertain and changing rapidly um, to, uh, to get kind of people um, to be considering um, pushing for a shorter working week as part of their negotiations. Um, so yeah, I think overall our kind of biggest um, uh, win, I guess, was to has been to kind of shift public opinion and show that um, not only is a four day week desirable, but it's also possible um, and achievable aim and something that people can and should be demanding. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that. Rachel and if people have questions for Rachel on the four day week campaign um, uh, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen um, and we'll do all, all the questions at the, at the very end once we've heard from all our speakers. I'm now going to hand over to Sean um, who uh, is from the Trade Unions for Energy Democracy. Um, Sean take it away. Oh you're on, you're on yeah. mute. Um, You're on mute. That's the phrase of the year, isn't it? You're it on mute. Really is. <laughs> um, hi, everybody from New York. Um, I've set my timer for 15 minutes, so um, hopefully I'll be disciplined. I'm going to talk a little bit about the work of Trade Unions for Energy Democracy, or TUED, T U E D, and I'm going to share my screen uh, right now because it's better looking than me. Um, let me see if I can find the I think this is it. How's that? Yeah, we can see that clearly. How's that? Good? Yeah, perfect. Well, um, it's just waiting to load at the moment. Oh. Can you see it? I can see it, yeah. If you Can you click through one screen? Oh, hang on. Um, We've got, uh, we're, so you, you are sharing the screen, but it's a gray, so we can see that. Yeah. You mean, I'm sorry, is that any better? Like, it means to be brighter, is that what's going on? No, we can see your screen now. Um, that's actually fine, we can see and we can see the presentation. Okay, uh, so I'm not sure what the problem is, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Um, okay. Um, so if, if you're happy to, yeah, place it. Sorry. How's that? That's, that works now for me. Okay, great, great. All right, I'll jump right in then. Um, so, Trade Unions for Energy Democracy, uh, it's a network of started in 2012 after the Rio plus 20 climate um, sort of sustainable development conference. A lot of unions in around the world were disgruntled with the whole green growth model, which some unions supported. So there was a bit of a division. And um, uh, the critique was that the green growth model was really a privatization agenda um, against state companies, state owned companies, and forcing public entities to compete with uh, renewable energy companies and so on. And uh, whereas unions wanted to support a decarbonization and a climate and ecological uh, agenda, they were being, it came as a package, the package being privatization and liberalization. Um, some unions could live with that, feeling that it was going to be a big jobs bonanza. Others could not. So we were on the side of the could not. And we convened a meeting in New York and started off uh, Trade Unions for Energy Democracy. We've got 72 unions now. And we also convened over the summer the Global Trade Union Assembly, 
to respond to COVID-19 and the economic impacts. So what do we do? Um, essentially, we, um, we offer research and analysis that we produce in New York on, on key questions around um, energy and climate change in particular. We understood or we accepted that there was really a vacuum in the left. Uh, there's a lot of slogans, a lot of radical demands, a lot of references to justice, including energy justice and energy democracy, but not too much by way of detail. So we felt we needed to dig into this. And that's why it's been a kind of sometimes a bit of a wonky experience with lots of technical detail, but we felt that was missing in the left. But we also convene and organize. We focus mostly on unions. This is not because we don't like other social movements. It's just that labor movement internationally is a big institution and uh, we're trying to organize within that space um, to promote a pro-public uh, agenda, uh, what we're call, we called a programmatic shift towards very strong commitments, not just to defending public services, but expanding public services and to reclaim to the public what has been privatized, particularly in the case of energy, which is crucially important. We have um, many of the unions in Chile have problems with this kind of social dialogue, uh, thinking it's very Europe-centered and doesn't speak to the rest of the world, but also primarily because it excludes questions of ownership. So social dialogue around working hours, for example, or around uh, um, uh, on, on various forms of equality have all been quite productive here and there. But there's never a discussion about the failure of the neoliberal model, particularly in terms of the context of climate change. So this was a meeting we did in Paris at COP21 with our friends, Jeremy Corbyn, Naomi Klein. Now, um, this, <clears throat> this is the kind of research paper we do. These are quite in-depth papers. Uh, they take a bit of work to get through them. Uh, but if we're trying to equip a new generation really of trade unionists and left uh, people with a sort of a, both a historical analysis, but also a technical appreci appreciation of some of the technical challenges involved in, uh, in, in energy transition. This is our paper on just transition. This was in 2012, which inspired CHUED, which was in South Africa, where the largest union in Africa, the National Union of Metal Workers, um, <clears throat> put forward the idea that renewables should be not be part of the privatization regime, but should be publicly owned. We see this is more recently uh, a report I worked on with others, including Transnational Institute and the unions there, to talk about rather than defend the status quo, which is public energy that burns a lot of coal, is to show how a public utility can be transformed and we would achieve climate targets and social targets more effectively than if we privatize the system, which is a fight. Sorry to interrupt, Sean. Um, this, this is not you at all. This is um, uh, the, the slides um, haven't moved from, from the first screen oh. that you did. Um, so this, this is totally a technical thing and not, not you at all. Okay. Um, would, it be, would it be possible just to kind of um, exit the full screen of the, um, of the presentation and then just scroll through with the slides that you had, even if they're a bit smaller on the screen. Is that okay? Can you see that one? I, I can, yeah, I can see that fine. It's just when it goes, for some reason, when it goes, um, when you do full screen, it um, something goes wrong. Yeah, um, okay. But we can see all of this absolutely fine. Um, oh. so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass it back over to you and so, so apologies for interrupting. No, no, not at all. I'm sorry, you can't see it. Um, okay, I'm going to try to scroll through then. This was the Just Transition paper. This is the renewable energy in South Africa. This is the most recent report. We also had some influence on the Green New Deal discussion in the US with the Bernie Sanders plan. Um, the first, the only candidate really to put forward the idea of public ownership of renewable energy, of new renewables. Um, we worked closely with Rebecca Long Bailey, of course, as, uh, as was mentioned earlier, Labour didn't get elected. Um, it's a huge missed opportunity. Um, we won't go into that now, but clearly the policies around energy and public ownership were not to blame for that. Um, the, we, this, here's uh, the European Public Services Unions, EPSU, uh, produced a report that we had some a say in, which is the failure of energy liberalization. And so this is part of the policy 
um, infrastructure, if you like, that's beginning to develop around a public goods approach and reclaiming energy. Um, you see here, we work closely with Transnational Institute, reclaiming public services, certain individual unions like public and commercial services have put out documents, um, analysis of the current situation. Now, what is our critique of green growth? Why is that a problem? Um, if you, 10 years ago, green growth, that sounds pretty good. You know, we can get grow the economy, create jobs and it'll be green. What's the problem? And the problem was, first of all, it's not happening. And second, it was, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it was largely a privatization agenda. Um, get the public entities out of the way, let um, innovative green tech take over, bad news. And this one of the areas we had to focus on is countering the myth. And here you see Al Gore saying, you know, the, um, it's inevitable uh, that the, the low carbon transition is gonna happen. Here's Ban Ki-moon, we've entered a new era the progression to low emission carbon, re climate resilient growth is inevitable. Here's Akim Steiner, the head of the um, then United Nations Environment Program, inevitable. You hear the word inevitable all the time. And yet what we did in Chile back in 2012 realized that it wasn't inevitable. In fact, if anything, it wasn't even happening. So here we see, for example, I'm not sure if you can, if my little signs here are getting in the way, um, Energy consumption, which is huge, hugely important, is not only increasing and continues to increase at an alarming rate, it's dominated by fossil fuels. So if we look at the blue there, that's all fossil-based energy in terms of world consumption. So we've had not only 20 years of this neoliberal model uh, and all the promises of it being inevitable, the transition, but we end up with more fossil fuels coming into the system. We've, we've characterized it in Chuet as an energy expansion, not an energy transition. So when you see charts that show renewable energy growing quite spectacularly in places, uh, it has to be seen in the context of overall global energy use. And this is a hugely important piece of information because the renewables industry likes to tell you, because they're privately owned and they're looking for more government support, they like to tell you that you know, they are cheaper now, that subsidies are no longer necessary, that they are gonna take over the global energy system. All they need now is a few more years of subsidies and support. And this is the reality. It's not happening because it relies on generation of private profit. That's one of the big problems. So oil use rising. I'll skip over these in the interest of time. You see there on the bottom right, how much in the global energy system, electricity, how much is wind and solar? It barely makes it on the map. Most renewable energy is large hydro systems, which are basically maxed out on a global scale for the most part. And most of it is um, non-renewable. <clears throat> so this is the kind of wake up call we need. Here's another chart that shows um, world energy consumption. And you can see the contribution of wind and solar down there very, very tiny. Consequently, emissions continue to rise. Of course, they're gonna go down this year because of COVID, but it's going down about 8% according to some, um, some estimates. But according to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, it would need to fall 8% every year until 2050 in order to reach the Paris climate targets. So we either have a string of pandemics to get us to net zero or we need a policy shift. I prefer the latter. Um, and here is the head of the International Energy Agency saying, my numbers are giving me some despair. So here's the problem with green growth. It's basically a hands-off approach saying, what we need to do is incentivize uh, private investment and we need a stick, which is the price on carbon. Very quickly, the price on carbon, 20 years after carbon pricing was proposed as the main policy mechanism for the neoliberal approach to climate protection and energy transition, we've got a world where only 16% of greenhouse gas emissions are subject to a price. And most of those, that price is under $10 or 10 euros, sorry, a ton. That is absolutely useless in terms of shaping investment decisions. So, it also, the price that when it's put on carbon, it usually gets passed downstream 
to workers. Here's the yellow vest struggle in France after the diesel carbon price on diesel fuel was introduced a couple of years ago. So what we have is the worst of both possible worlds. We have workers paying for the carbon, but the carbon ends up in the atmosphere anyway, because no one is changing their behavior at all, but the workers face the brunt of this. This is true also with energy subsidies in the global south. The IMF and the World Bank want to remove subsidies, which is mostly consumer subsidies, and then that hits workers and they end up protesting. Now, if all this was leading to decarbonization, we'd be okay, but it's not. And here's Bloomberg New Energy Finance, the other NEF. It's an open question of who will provide the required funding. Now, think for a moment what that means. It's an open question who will provide here we have 10 years to reduce emissions by 50% or so, and we're way behind. And it's an open question where the money is gonna come. So let's look at the carrots, subsidies for renewable energy. We saw Germany's solar miracle, and that's always been touted as the model for the energy transition. Germany, municipal control, community energy, and so on. But who paid for the subsidies? 40 billion euro goes on to electricity bills, so we have Yes, renewable energy costs are falling, but retail costs for electricity are rising. There are lots of reasons for this. Um, and I would like, you know, I don't have time to go into the details, but I'd recommend looking at this paper that came out earlier this year, the rise and fall of community energy in Europe. Unlike many of the environmental groups who we love, um, they have, I think, a disproportionate faith in community energy and energy citizenship as a way of challenging, uh, of, of promoting the energy transition. And we show that this was totally dependent on subsidies. And it was also, um, and my time is almost up, totally dependent on subsidies. And it was also very marginal in terms of the overall energy system. So we need a comprehensive reclaiming to public ownership of energy systems in Europe and elsewhere in the world. Here's just a quick look at investment in the minute or so I have left. Here you see it going down, you see it going down in China, all because the same policies are being pursued. Here's a quote I'd like you to look at, if you don't mind. Renewables generally do not offer opportunities that investors are looking for in terms of market capitalization, dividends, or liquidity. In other words, companies, the cheaper renewable energies gets, the less profitable becomes, the more private investors look elsewhere. They are not interested in low profit um, investment. So this means where does the money come from? It has to be public investment. And that's the way most electricity came into the world. Most of the global safe today would still be in the dark if it wasn't for public energy systems. Meanwhile, workers in places like Fife in Scotland um, are not getting the work in offshore wind because it's going to countries like Indonesia and nothing against Indonesian workers, but if you're looking for a social license for the energy transition, then you got to start producing the jobs locally uh, where the energy is going to be generated. So we're advocating very strongly and unapologetically for a public goods approach. This needs to be, it may sound like pie in the sky, but if, if, uh, if it does sound more challenging given the, the political moment we're in, we have to ask ourselves, what does and business as usual look like with the neoliberal model. It's gonna be no energy transition, more climate change, less jobs and more social dislocation. So the, the sort of general principle is emissions er, gen, generated anywhere in the world hurts everyone and emissions reduced or avoided helps everyone. So this has to be the simple principle around technology sharing, around uh, public goods approach, around investing in energy transition as a public service. And that includes all energy technologies need to be considered. We cannot just imagine a world full of wind and, uh, wind and solar panels and, uh, and expect that to generate uh, the electricity we need. We need to focus on energy conservation, management and democratic control. So I'm sorry that was a bit rushed and I apologize for the technical challenges. Uh, please check out unionsforenergydemocracy.org. There are a bunch of working papers there. If you're in a union and you're interested in having uh, your union participate in CHUED, that's pretty easy. Just let us know. It has to be a formal decision. 
um, and it ha we have to be able to um, put the logo of the union on our website and look out for the next Chewhead events. And I appreciate the opportunity to have uh, the opportunity to share these thoughts with you today. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for that, Sean. That was a great talk um, and no need to apologize for the technical error. I think we can blame Zoom <laughs> um, as I blame a lot of things in my life. Um, I am um, now gonna pass over to Katerina um, and um, yeah, if you're ready to go, Katerina, hopefully no technical issues, but um, we'll let you know if there are any, uh, but take it away. Thank you. Yeah, I will try and I hope you can hear me good or hear me all right. Um, I have wrote everything I wanted to say down because my English is, well, sometimes it slips. Um, and I will start my timer right now so that I will keep in my, stay in my time. Um, yeah, I'm Katarina. I'm from Leipzig in Germany and um, I'm part of the Fridays for Future movement. Um, I'm part of the Students for Future, which are the uh, yeah, students at the university who are coming together and joining the Fridays for Future movement. And I became part of uh, Fridays for Future early on because uh, I think like so many young people, I was um, yeah, inspired by uh, the young people uh, going on the streets and uh, marching and protesting. And uh, also I am uh, part of the Union Verdi, which maybe some of you might know. Um, and I, I am a member of Verdi because I um, started in my nursing school and became a member and stayed a member, even though I am a student right now and study history at the university. Um, I started in the Fridays for Future movement because uh, like so many others, I uh, felt like the climate crisis is so noticeable and um, yeah, becoming a bigger and bigger problem. And, I saw that uh, so many scientists were uh, shouting out that it's a big problem, we have to start doing something and nobody was doing anything. So um, yeah, and nobody came collectively together uh, to change it. So I uh, saw the Fridays for Future movement and joined it. And uh, I think the crisis, even though it is affecting people in not Europe, but other countries, um, other continents even uh, worse, is starting to have uh, the effects already in Germany. Yesterday on the, what was it like 23rd of October, it was 19, 19 degrees in Germany. So like, I didn't even have to put a jacket on. It was really crazy, really hot outside. And um, yeah, I got into the movement and uh, today I'm actually here to talk about a project which we're doing, uh, which is a cooperation with uh, the Union Verdi. And we're talking about a Verkehrswende project, which is translated roundabout in a transportation change or a project for better public uh, transport. Um, and it's a project which we're working on for, I think, over a year right now. Um, we've been uh, working on this topic uh, with Verdi um, for, yeah, I think since last year in uh, June or something, uh, even before Corona. And um, yeah, I will want to try to explain uh, and show what makes this coalition between like the movement Fridays for Future and the union so special and uh, so important. Um, so almost two years ago, we started uh, Fridays for Future movement here in Germany. And we started uh, right away with a group of Fridays for Future. Um, that's called Union Dialogue Group. And we were uh, right from the start talking to um, all the DGB, like the big union um, unions in Germany, also like the IG Metall and the IG BCE and yeah, the unions which normally you wouldn't consider working with if you're a climate activist because it's the people who produce the cars and uh, dig the coal. So, um, but we, uh, our group of activists who are uh, from the beginning conscious of the power of unions and uh, normally you would say okay Fridays for Future it's a lot of young people who are I don't know uh, consumer criticism and uh, green party uh, oriented people but there are some who are also like anti-capitalist and uh, yeah interested in union organize uh, organization and so we started to um, contact the unions to find a project and maybe find some 
way to work together. And um, yeah, so we started this uh, talk and uh, we saw in Verdi, which the, also Verdi, the union, which is um, yeah, represent, uh, representing also the uh, bus drivers. We saw the big fight coming, which is right now this year, the big uh, contract negotiation uh, for a German wide contract uh, for all the bus drivers and tram drivers and uh, everybody who works in public transport. Um, it affects um, this contract is something Verdi prepared for four years. They like finalized all the contracts till the 13th of June and uh, it affects 70% of the public transport in all of Germany. And uh, it's uh, about uh, 90,000 people who work in the public transport in those, um, yeah, in those areas. And yeah, we talked to Verdi about it because we uh, thought it's very interesting to uh, get the fight uh, for better public transport, um, get uh, into this fight because um, the Fridays for Future movement is always saying that like we have to get away from the uh, cars. We don't, uh, yeah, we don't want everybody using a car and having a car because the pollution, it's like the third biggest pollution sector is uh, mobility and transport. And we um, we're always, uh, yeah, declaring war on the car, but we have no real option. So um, that's why we were like, okay, we have to think about public transport. But if you think about public transport, you have to think also about the worker who is driving the buses because you can stream all you want and can say all you want, like we need more buses, but if there's nobody who wants to drive the buses, well, you uh, don't have buses yet that can drive themselves. And uh, it's also about the yeah, working conditions of the people. And uh, yeah, Fridays for Future uh, calls itself a climate justice movement. So it's also about justice for the bus drivers and uh, the tram dri drivers. And uh, so that's why we, why we uh, got in the fight together with uh, Verdi and we made a big plan and Verdi was uh, very convinced and uh, very enthusiastic also because the fight, if you have like striking bus drivers, is, it's always the, the headline of the paper is always, oh, the children who are left on the streets can't get to work, it's, uh, can't get to school, it's so bad. and. Um, we as Friday for Future are the ones who are saying, well, if this school children are saying, well, it's okay that our bus driver is striking because his working conditions are really, really bad. Well, that's, uh, well, some positive um, message and might be, um, yeah, getting uh, less trouble for the bus drivers. And also the um, Verdi said, um, it's really hard because the strikes are right now with Corona and the COVID-19 crisis uh, getting even worse and everybody is um, yeah, trying to blame, I don't know, infections on public transport. So it's really good to have someone who's having your back. And as we are trying to fight for better working conditions and uh, more public transport that uh, works perfectly together. Just to give you one uh, view of what the working conditions are in the public transport, they're really, really bad. I live in Leipzig here and the people, they earn like 12 euros an hour and they have like, if you have, um, if your bus is delayed because someone was holding the door and you um, have to get, turn around, like you make your tour and then you stop, normally you drive off uh, 15 minutes later. If you have a delay, you won't get paid for it and your break shortens itself since it's a delay. And the problem is that a lot of bus drivers, they have like real bladder uh, problems and have like a colon cancer uh, rate is higher in those jobs. And it's like significantly, uh, yeah, a big problem because of the working conditions and they don't earn really much. And so, and they're not even all over the place. They're like not on every stop, there's a toilet for the bus drivers. So especially for women bus drivers, it's not very comfortable. Um, so that's all the information we got uh, during talking to bus drivers, which is um, yeah, very, a very interesting uh, point and a very interesting situation. So um, 
Mm -hmm. uh, that's all about like the working conditions. And um, yeah, we started in February to get together with like 80 people. It was activists, was bus drivers, union members trying to make a great plan. And then Corona hit us and uh, everything was like the whole plan of like, okay, we're going to make some very important days and we're going to go out on the streets and organize everything and talk to the local theaters, the schools, everybody should join, it was all ruined. And uh, that's also like a very a big struggle we have right now because the second wave is coming. Um, but uh, we restarted in about April or May and um, started with Zooms like these. We had like hundreds of um, activists coming together in a Zoom conference and we had bus drivers speaking. We had like the union members speaking We had Students for Future and Fridays for Future speaking. And it was really interesting to uh, find out like the, we have the same issue. The same issue is that we want better conditions for everyone and we want the climate crisis to end or we ha want to fight the climate crisis and uh, yeah, have better living conditions and have a future in this world. And um, the fight is always against up there, like the politics, because the Fridays for Future are on the streets for two, over two years now screaming and nothing's changing and if you look at uh, the bus driving sectors it's like uh, they're screaming for over 20 years now and um, the I don't know austerity politics is hitting them really hard and they are not getting even um, yeah a bit better wages. So um, since September there are really strikes like real bus driver strikes they should have happened in June already but Corona pushed it all back to the year and now we have in over 30 cities, Fridays for Future and bus drivers uh, going, joining uh, in a strike. And I might just find uh, some pictures here. I hope you can see this. Maybe someone can give me. Yeah, we can see, that's great. You can see it. So this is uh, like um, what we did. Uh, we went into the local tram and made signs for the uh, for the drivers and we put it in the back because the following train should see it and that's the driver. Um, here we have uh, some climate activists joining together with the bus drivers. Um, yeah, it's uh, so many funny pictures and that's like Corona times. We have the union member and we have the Fridays for Future um, activists. They all with uh, covering their mouth and nose. Yeah, I have some uh, so many pictures of this and it's really, really great to see. And uh, I just want to uh, just point out in the last minutes what I think is so special about this. Um, because on the one side, and this picture might just be perfect for it, we have uh, young climate acti activists who are predominantly female and um, mostly from a very privileged background. Um, and they're, yeah, really, it's the mostly the first time that there is that they are pol uh, political activist. And um, yeah, they come from a very diverse uh, movement. And on the other hand, you have the bus drivers and the union members who are mostly in between 45 and 55 years old and um, might just have fought a lot of fights, but as we know, uh, not have won so many and has not have not been so successful. And uh, they are mostly men. So uh, young, wild, female and older traditional male, uh, you wouldn't have guessed if they could come together, which is, uh, I think, very uh, nice to see that it works. And if you find out that you have the same enemy, kind of, um, you uh, can come together and have um, yeah join the fights and uh, yeah it's right now this photo looks uh, really nice and I don't know I talk about it really lightly but it's a hell of a lot of work it's like calls and so many talks so many like getting behind the uh, I don't know uh, behind so many people and standing there and talking and talking I have been to strikes um like the last week we joined the strikes at 3 um, a.m in the morning and we uh yeah stand there with bus drivers in the pouring rain 
and it's still something sometimes a bus driver comes up to us and says what do you want here it's not your fight and you always have to explain why you're doing this and why you want to join the fight and why it's not just their fight it's our fight and in the end it's really interesting because i don't know i've had so many talks with bus drivers i don't know about i don't know 50 60 uh, on the on the different strike days but it's always in the beginning they're all really really skeptical and in the end they're like well it's true and they would never call themselves climate activists but they get why we are calling them this way because it's the job for the future it's like public transport is so important and we have to expand public transport and we want uh, to have better uh, working conditions for the for the people so yeah it's uh really uh, nice to see all the pictures we have like so many uh people and the buses are uh maybe i yeah this is also very nice it was in hamburg they surrounded the uh, the mayor's office uh, with uh, so many people and uh, had a collage of uh, photos uh, for for the mayor. Yeah, that's me. This is at 3 a.m. in the morning and it says like climate, uh, to keep the climate, you have to support your striking people like the strikers. Um, yeah, and maybe I will, uh, well, leave on this note. I'll stop here and uh, yeah. Come Thank you so much on. for that, Katarina. Um, yeah, it's a great, great note to, to finish on and the pictures are wonderful. Um, it's great seeing people still taking action, even during Corona times. Um, a final reminder that if you have questions for our speakers, that there is a, um, a Q&A uh, option at the bottom of your screen where you can click and then type questions for our, any of our panelists. Um, um, I'll, I'll introduce uh, our last panelist now, uh, who's Esther Lynch. Um, who's speaking from the European Union, um, sorry, <coughs> uh, Deputy General Secretary of the European Trade Union Confederation. Over to you, Esther. Thanks very much. It's, it's, I seem to have gone all dark, um, whichever way I'm sitting in the, in the, okay, that might be a bit more. Thank yeah, you. that's good. A bit better at the end. Uh, Katrina, I think that was a really inspirational presentation. I want to thank you for it. I've, I've had a tough, I'd have had a tough week and what better way to end on a Friday, but with a practical example of exactly what we're all trying to achieve, which is to call out the exploitation of both workers uh, and the planet, and to make sure that people understand that there's a link between both, and that our strategies need to, to, to be more joined up. Um, I've been asked to come and talk about working time reduction, um, and uh, I was, I was trying to think about, about how to start and it, and, it, and it struck me that one of my guilty pleasures is an English TV series called Downton Abbey. And that series um, is set in the early 1900s. Um, and there's a scene from 1912, which perfectly captures class privilege. Uh, it's a big stately home. They're having a, a dinner and the, one of the guests at the dinner says, I'm going to go to such and such a place for the weekend. And the countess turns around entirely confounded and says, what's the weekend? And of course the aristocracy didn't need a weekend to enjoy any free time because they were free to go whenever they wanted to go uh, and to do what, whatever they wanted to do whenever they wanted to do it. But it was exact opposite for everybody who worked there. So there was no weekend for them because they weren't free. They weren't, you know, that the, there wasn't the idea that, that people would be entitled uh, to uh, an eight hour day um, or to uh, a five day week um, or to holidays. Um, all, all of that was at the, the, the discretion, the, the decision, and you had to bow and scrape. Um, and, and by bowing and scraping, you might get some time off. Um, hardly likely to be paid to be a paid holiday though. And the reason I mention that is to show that things can change. And the moment when this changed was uh, 1919. And it changed in 1919 uh, by the International Labour Organization uh, concluding in the wake of the First World War 
that injustice anywhere threatens peace. And the first convention they concluded was on working hours. And it was for an eight hour day, and it was for a 48 hour week, and it also was for holidays. And that came in the wake, as I said, of the contribution. And, and, it, and it was understood that people had paid with their lives during the First World War. And I think we have a similar moment with COVID in that there is, there is some recognition even among those political parties, which I know nobody here and I myself do not support. Um, but even among them, there is, there, there is a recognition that something needs to be done to end the, the, the rampant injustice. And to recognize that during COVID, the most vulnerable workers, the, the front line of the front line, exactly the people that Katrina was talking about showed up and carried on working and did what was needed. And that it isn't acceptable that all those people will be put to the end of some queue and only after everybody else is sorted out will we get around to thinking about their, their needs. So I think it's very clear on, at least within the European trade union movement, that part of the, the future of work, the fair future of work needs to be about ours. And I apologize, but I'm gonna get a bit uh, EU focused now because um, and we have at EU level um, the European Working Time Directive, and that in 1993 set out a threshold of working time, including overtime, to be a maximum of 48 hours a week. The average in the EU at the moment is 37 hours a week, but of course there's big differences. Greece, 41 hours a week, the Netherlands, 30 hours a week. But what you can do throughout the the European Union is trace a, a steady but slow, slowing reduction uh, in the in the number of hours uh, of of working time. So there is a need now for a major clear demand um, relating to the reduction of working time, and we're beginning to see within the movement some examples of that um, uh, being debated. We've seen. Uh, the demands for, for the four-day week. We've also seen uh, unions such as Iggy Metal uh, was also mentioned by Katrina, putting onto, onto the bargaining agenda um, a reduction in, in working time in which some of the, the time is remains paid. The employer takes uh, some of the, um, we we'll say some of the savings, um, but, the, um, uh, but the state also steps in. And while a lot of these schemes were developed uh, to, to cope with COVID, I think what they do is, 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 is they, they, they do establish an example of solidaristic um, approaches. And if we were to have a just transition, not only in terms of climate, but also in terms of digitalization, there, there has to be an opportunity for people to retrain and part of that can be reducing working time and during that other time that uh, retraining is available for people. But more importantly, there also needs to be recognition that increases in productivity shouldn't be taken just by the, the shareholders, that those increases in productivity need to be shared, fairly shared with the workforce. And part of that can come in the form of reduced working time without reduced in pay. There's one other issue I'd like to, to put onto, onto the agenda and that's, and that's the common day off. And the, it used to be the case that article five of the EU directive said that in principle, uh, the, the, the rest period would include a, a Sunday and at the time, the Court of Justice decided that there was no proof that Sunday work uh, was, that the having Sunday off was more um, beneficial for health and safety uh, reasons. But since that, that disastrous ruling um, of 1996, the evidence has been melting about the importance of having a common day off. And it only stands to reason if you can have time with your family 
um, on a Sunday, if you have time to volunteer, if you have time for civic engagement to join the local football club, to play sports. So if you, if you know that everybody has Sunday as the day to do that, I'm not necessarily making the case for Sunday. It's just that, that Sunday um, is, is, used to be uh, the common day off. And I think that that, that, that needs to be restored uh, as, part of, as part of our discussion about the need for our work, the rhythm of working life to better support people's civic, voluntary engagement, family opportunities. I say that as a mother, I like to cook for my family on a Sunday. It gets, makes me feel better, you know? Um, and I think, I think there's, there's that, 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 that to some extent the left, because of the religious overtones, has been afraid of being involved in this discussion. And I'd encourage you to, 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 to put it back on the table, the idea um, of, of a common day off. Um, I think then, um, as I said, there are already lots of examples of unions beginning to come forward and to try and, and, and negotiate the change. And, and I think that that has to be, that has to be recognized as the only way, the only fair way forward is if it's, is if these changes are negotiated. And it needs to be, the, those, those, those negotiations need to recognize that you can't have a one size fits all approach to this. That so many workers are struggling with not knowing how many hours work they're gonna get this week. And for them, uh, a reduction in working time would be a disaster. It would be a disaster because they won't be able to afford the rent and they won't be able you know, to, to feed their families. So, 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 so there does need to be some recognition that, that not everybody has, has a nine to five guaranteed uh, permanent job, um, but, but that for other people, they, 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 they really are already under so much pressure and struggling, and struggling with an exploitative employer uh, on their back. So there needs to be, um, there needs to be leadership and that leadership needs to come from, from the sectors where we're stronger. And we need to, to have examples of, of, of good agreements uh, that establish how you fairly achieve this change. And that's why I disagree a bit with what Sean said is that I think European social dialogue is, is without doubt a good way forward for us at the ETUC because it would allow us to conclude a blueprint template approach to this one which would use, this, use, this, use the strength of where we're strong to help unions where they're weak. So we could use the strength of our colleagues uh, in the Nordic countries, the strength of our colleagues uh, in Germany and France, and use that to help the unions in the East who are struggling with, 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 with a very deliberate strategy based on low road, low pay, uh, competition between workers on wages and conditions. So if we could help by having EU level strategies and blueprints that assist them and support them. And indeed, if we were to say to companies who, who negotiate with the unions, for example, in Germany, but then they turn up in Bratislava and say that there'll be no union in here. But if we could begin to use where we're strong to get good bargaining power where we're weaker, so that those workers too could have a fair transition, that, that indeed a, a reduced working week would not be something that would be frightening, but would be something that, 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 that workers would welcome. I think that has to be part of our strategy. And I think EU social dialogue is a way to do that. It's not easy, but it is a way to do it. So I wouldn't write off EU uh, social dialogue. The other, the other, the other interesting thing, and I think it was, it's interesting that Verdi is so much on the pitch uh, in, in, in Katrina's example, is that governments are large employers. They still are, even though there's been an awful lot of privatization, they are still large employers. And they could lead by example. They could lead by example going, for going by to, to, for example, a two and a half day weekend. Um, that, that, there, that, that, that there are all sorts of ways in which governments could, could say to unions, come in, we want to have discussions, we want to reduce working time, we want to identify a way in which that can be done fairly, but also in a way that is aligned in the work in the rhythm of working life uh, within society. And we need to begin to have those discussions. And um, for sure, I'm looking around Europe and I see in a lot of, of union congresses, 
uh, beginnings of the discussion to put together um, a, a negotiating agenda for that. Um, indeed, governments can use their purchasing power. So instead of using their purchasing power as, as the example of the um, uh, bus drivers, is, which is to go to the lowest uh, tender and the lowest tender being on the basis of, of exploitative conditions, governments could also say, well, we were, we're going to establish that our purchasing uh, schemes all support uh, companies that bargain with unions for a, fair, for, a, for a fair and just transition, and a fair and just transition in terms of the workforce, but also in terms of sustainable matters as well. The um, final point then is, is that consumer power actually is more effective. I used, to, I, used to, I, I used to be quite dismissive of the whole consumer power thing. Um, but I think now people are becoming a lot more, those who can afford to, are becoming a lot more discerning. And I think having a recognisable trademark symbol for businesses that deal with the union, that have in place a, a just transition, um, and that they're very clear, look, you know, um, the basis on which we're competing um, isn't on low road exploitation and misery, but the basis on which we're competing is on a fair and sustainable future, including for our workforce. I think that that might be something uh, that could be uh, of interest to discuss and exactly just to go back to where Katrina ended up as well, so that we would have this linking up um, and, and support uh, between the two. Then, 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 then finally, I think, I think COVID is a moment of, of, of change, but there's nothing that says what, what direction that change is, is gonna flow in. And, and I think people are looking around for ideas now. And so, so I think uh, a steady approach um, to identifying the opportunities, the different ways in which reduced working time can be achieved through negotiated agreements, combined with the benefits of, for, we we'll say, the economy and for uh, the planet, um, for society, for families, for well-being, uh, for health and safety, for you know, for, for for all those things. I think it can only help, uh, and that was why I was anxious to be here today, is to call for that joined up solidaristic um, approach. And I want to thank you for, for giving me uh, the time today. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Esther. And that was a great note to end on. Um, we're, we're now moving to our um, Q&A session. Um, so if you have any questions at all um, for our speakers, please do put them in the Q&A boxes, which is at the bottom of your screen. Um, I have a few questions already. Um, and I guess this is to all of our panelists. Um, often the arguments around both, um, or sometimes the arguments around both um, the environment and working time reduction are put forward in, in quite an abstract and, and elitist way and take place in quite elite institutions, far away from the people who will be most impacted by the changes discussed. How do you ensure in the work that you do that, that workers um, and those who are most impacted by the proposed changes are at the heart of the transition which you're seeking to achieve. So anyone can jump in or I can I can pick a name. Sean, do you wanna have a go? Oh, can't hear you, Sean. Sorry, man. Um, I, I actually missed a bit of the question. So rather than repeat the question, Perhaps someone will jump in and I'll try to plug in. Cool. Rachel, shall I hand over to you then? Sure. Okay. Um, so, yeah, as I kind of um, spoke about in my um, in my talk, I think that for the four day week campaign, a lot of what we've done previously has focused on on um, kind of political influencing. Um, and I think that the kind of what we're moving towards now, which is, is going through unions, um, is um, 
a way of making sure that yeah that that, that, that this is a demand that comes from um from the workers themselves um i could maybe speak a bit about what i've done in my my own workplace um because i'm a union rep um in my workplace and we're kind of moving towards um demanding in our next or demanding having on the negotiating table um a shorter working hours for our um uh yeah as part of our kind of pay deal for the next for the coming year and um that is something that has taken i would say about a year to build consensus on in our workplace um so through things like um bringing up a uh, meetings and um, using tools such as surveys to um, like gauge where people are at, um, creating a working group within our, our membership of people who are kind of like willing to um, push this idea forward and have conversations with, with individual members to kind of like talk about how it could work in our organization, um, ex using external speakers to give some kind of clarity on how it could work um, have been ways that we've kind of shift, shifted the debate um, in terms of, yeah, shifted the debate so that it's now something that, in fact, actually, um, as reps, we decided, or not decided, but we'd kind of taken it off our agenda for a bit because of, of we were kind of dealing with so much other stuff to do with coronavirus. But actually, it then became members who were saying, actually, do you know what, we need a four day week now because we're, um, because we're super stressed um, from uh, the kind of increasing workload that we've had due to coronavirus. Um, so in a weird way, that kind of de demand came back kind of full circle and came from the members and now we're kind of pushing forward on it again. Um, I think something that um, I guess is a takeaway from that is that like that's one work, this is one workplace. I mean, my workplace is big, it has 800 people, but that's still like a fraction of the workers in the UK. And I do think that, um, whilst like um, uh, change coming down from government is 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 one way to achieve things, and it's it it can happen quite swiftly. Um, I think it's important to get buy-in from from workers, but it does you know it takes a lot of time and effort, and and organising is like a long-term process that is you know tiring and like involves lots of people putting a lot of work into it so i think it's um it's it's not it's not quick and it's not easy but it's something that it i think the if you sow the seeds then the rewards are kind of bigger um from from getting um uh from doing that kind of organizing and i, I kind of talked a little bit about how um you know, we've kind of brought the idea to the public imagination, but it's not necessarily, you know, people aren't kind of demanding it themselves. And I think that, yeah, that would maybe have been somewhere where we've, we've had a bit of a blind spot and are now addressing because, you know, you can say, you can have as many newspaper articles as you want about the benefits of a four day week, but unless people actually think that it's something that they could um, do in their own lives, then it's, in my mind, it's, it's not gonna happen. Um, I hope that was a little bit of a, it wasn't 100% answering the question, but I hope it kind of got there. No, it was great. I mean, you spoke from several different perspectives about how this process can be bottom up as, as well as top down. Um, are, are there any other speakers that want to step in? Otherwise, there's other questions that we have. Um, I have, um, uh, I guess, a, yeah, quite an interesting question actually from um, Ursula, um, who has asked, do you think advocating for an increase in individually negotiated working time reductions, um, in addition to kind of collective trade union bargaining agreements, would be a positive development, as it would help to normalise the idea of working less, um, like what happens often in, in Holland? Um, or is that something of a regressive move, as it excludes those on lower incomes with greater family responsibilities? So to be clear, this is a question about working time reduction from an individual point of view and having the right to individually reduce your hours, albeit with a cut in pay, which would obviously exclude those um, uh, who cannot afford it. Is that good, bad, or somewhere in between? So Rachel and Esther, I think this is, this is for you. Maybe Esther, it would be interesting to hear from your perspective on this. Well, 
can you can you see me okay because I've, I've i've just lost all, all okay so yeah, I, I can see you you're good <laughs> so, um, i don't know what i've done the, um uh, some emails came in and i made the mistake of trying to look at them the um so uh um I think that that right already exists because under the part-time work directive, you, um, there's a right for workers to request uh, part-time work hours and then the employer can only uh, refuse where they have a, an objective reason. Um, uh, my own experience is that collective agreements often already provide for this so it's not that you have to do it outside the collective agreement you can do it within the frame of the collective agreement so for example the collective agreement will establish uh, the way in which uh, you can request this the protections uh, for for people who requ requesting reduced hours and then most importantly how people return to to the full-time work if that's what what they choose to do so in terms of individual, we say, circumstances, that already exists. It's not the type of game changer I think that we need to be uh, looking at. And the type of game changer I think we need to be looking at is how in the rhythm of work do we begin to, on the one hand, address the 24 hour constantly on always connected um, type of uh, uh, demands that employers make now. Now, I know they make those demands in a very subtle way, but they're made anyway. Um, uh, like how do we make sure that people have the right to disconnect? How do we make sure that people have enough hours so that they're not frightened every week waiting for a text message to tell them whether they're going to have hours of work this week? How do we address that? And at the same time, how do we then move uh, the larger, more permanent based employments uh, to a reduced uh, working time. And that whether we do that on a, on, a, on, a, on a one by one, I don't know if you're interested in, if you also want to get the benefits of uh, the re reduction in the number of people on public transport and the um, number of hours of energy that an office uses. I don't know that, that you that, that you secure those benefits um, if you're doing it on a one by one basis, rather than if you're trying to do it um, by larger sections um, of uh, the workforce taking the lead on it. You probably there's probably a lot more people here uh, who know the answer to that question better better than I do in terms of the the gains uh, that you get for for improving um, or or of or for, it just strikes me instinctively that if if everybody finished work with say on a Friday afternoon um, and the office closed, you're going to get a better with say sustainability um, uh, achievement from that than if than if one person says I need to go home. You know I want to negotiate a going home early every Friday. You know so 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 there's just. They're just two different um, things. That's not to say that they're against each other, but the only thing I would say, it's always the case that you should deal with, with, with any individual, um, with any changes that individuals can make, you should incorporate a protective um, environment around that within the collective agreement. Sorry, that was a, a waffly answer, but, that, but, that, but that's my- yeah. No, it's really comprehensive. Thank you so much, Esther. Um, have um, another question, um, this is, more specifically for Sean, but for Katerina as well. Um, and it's reflecting on one of our speakers yesterday, um, Juliet Shaw, who, who made the point that the cut between GDP is, is happening um, and we see a decrease in. I didn't. Was it just you. me or didn't I just. No, 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 no. We lost him. <laughs> Uh, okay, I will ask the question. <laughs> so, um, okay, okay, just trying to find it. Um, tuk -tuk 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 -tuk. Sorry, sorry for you manage. Uh, yes, uh, the question was um, 
yesterday, Juliet Shaw made a very strong point at decoupling, uh, at, but that the decoupling between GDP growth and carbon emission is just not happening. And therefore we have to limit GP, GDP growth, even it decrease in the, in the global north. Your presentation substantiated that further, but she also pointed out that instead of talking morally about redu re reducing consumption, we should talk more positively about what we have to offer in exchange for reducing energy consumption. Plenty of pleasure, the cost of reducing, of reducing extremely carbon intensive activity. Should the uh, TED or student for future also pick up on this? Uh, less energy consumption, mm -hmm. less production, less work, more leisure. Should I take a chance? Should I try to answer that? Yes, please. Okay, I, I am not sure if I, it, my name is mentioned, and I'm not sure. I, it's yeah. I mean, it's a. I think for the perspective of TUED, the question is what new, what can we bring to the discussion that's different. Um, we've pointed out, as many many others, long before TUED came out, that decoupling. Uh, using the idea of green growth as a sort of in the belief that um, energy efficiency, what they call ecological modernization, is going to eventually get to a point where there's a decoupling is, is um, very, very flawed and misleading. It's not going to happen. And um, even I'll just use an example of how misleading this can be. The World Resources uh, Institute, I think they call WRI, um, put out a study saying 23 countries have managed to decouple growth from emissions, including the UK, for example. What they didn't say, of course, is that they've offshored most of their manufacturing to other countries. So the emissions that were not being created in, in say, Europe are being created in India and China and elsewhere. This is not meant as a criticism of India and China in that respect, but it's a reality that global GDP growing, doesn't matter if the production may shift around, um, so I think the, the question is, what do we bring to it? And, and energy, you know, the, the focus on sort of energy conservation, I think is, is hugely important because the IPCC has acknowledged that 40% of emissions reductions that they, that are, uh, projected or hoped for in the case of the Paris commitments, the well below two degrees has to come from energy efficiency and conservation. So this somehow has to become a kind of a, a you know, a, a leading policy discussion. What the IPCC says and others say, International Energy Agency, is there's no viable market for energy conservation. If electricity bills are say 50 euros a month or 100 euros a month, and individuals are expected to pay for the insulation of their homes, many of them don't own their own homes, it's just basically, if we're doing it on the basis of a market, it's not gonna, people are not gonna do it. Then there's the issue, and I know I'm going on a bit long, but there's the issue of industrial consumption. When electricity is part of a cost of say running a factory, those costs get passed on down to consumers. It doesn't change the behavior. Um, so, and the carbon price, as I pointed out in my presentation has been completely ineffective really in terms of um, of reducing, uh, of, of advancing efficiency. So Juliet is right. The question is what, but where do, how do we programmatically build on that commitment of uh, the sort of degrowth discussion? And um, we'd like to be involved in it, but it's a bandwidth question for us. You know, we need to have the, um, we, we don't have this, the staff or the expertise really to play a constructive role, but would certainly encourage others to, to do that. Last point I would make is, you know, the concept, and this speaks to the questions of transport that was raised, electrification of everything is another big challenge because we're talking about decarbonizing the power generation, transport systems, heating and cooling systems, food and agriculture systems, and the amount of energy needed to do that, electricity, to replace fossil fuels is another massive challenge. These are the kind of debates we should be having in the movement and not leave it to ex energy experts who uh, are very good people, many of them, but they're sort of not gonna be addressing some of these big social challenges that we need to confront. 
So I think that's the debates we're going to be having. But let's drill down on the details a bit more. I think Juliet's work is fantastic because she points to examples of, of, of how um, like platforms and different uh, communities can do certain things. I really admire what she's doing. And I think we need more of that and think big picture. Sorry for the lengthy response. Thank you so much for that, Sean. And I'm, I'm back. Sod's law that my bloody internet cut out as I was asking a question. Um, the follow on to that question, um, which, it, which is also comes from Juliet, was about the kind of the positive vision put forward by um, uh, um, at the back end of what you've just said. So if we have if we have to live in a world where we have to reduce consumption and ultimately reduce a lot of energy use, what, what, what's what's the positive vision of that future? And she says that um, we should have working time reduction. Like that's the exchange that the economy should give us rather than material goods, um, um, kind of an ever expanding material pile, we should be getting um, increased leisure time. And that's the positive vision that you give to an, an environmental world where ultimately we have to think seriously about reducing ultimately the amount of energy that we're using it, um, and material consumption. Um, could you respond to that a little bit? Because um, and the, the person who asked the question felt it, felt it was missing from your presentation. Yeah, it's, um, I think we've got to think about, there's system level discussions that need to happen. And it's interesting, about 10 years ago, there was an opinion poll of top chief, um, chief executive officers of companies. And they ag actually agreed. Most of them said, we need to reduce energy, we need to reduce consumption, we need to reorganize society. They were thinking more in terms of, as a, as a member of the human race, but they also understood that individual companies are in, and this is the, this is the, in the DNA of capitalism, is about maximizing production, maximizing sales, knocking the other guy down as much as you can. So how do we get out of that, you know, fatal suicidal logic of competition? And this is where public goods has to come in. It's where public ownership has to come in of key sectors. We can and shouldn't have public ownership of everything, but we have to control key sectors, energy, transportation, finance, food and agriculture, in a way that we can say those things that need to happen to put us on a path to true sustainability, they can happen because we are liberated from the logic of making money and profit. We all know the productive capacity of the world is more than enough to satisfy um, human needs. Even the poorest in the world could easily, if we had a more sharing distributive, I would say so socialist, democratic socialist economy globally, we could do that. And people have many things more than enough in terms of their material goods in many parts of the world. In other parts of the world, there is starvation and poverty and precariousness. So this is how we have this big discussion has to come up in really big narrative questions, but let's not leave it there. We have to do the work on how do we make it happen? How does our vision of a better world, how would it work in practice? And that's, I think, the work everybody in this call is trying to do right now when we're talking about working hours. So I'm thrilled to be part of the discussion. Thanks so much for that, Sean. I've got um, a question um, more explicitly for Katerina. Um, and the person has said, thank you for the beautiful examples of environmental activists supporting a labour dispute of strategical importance. Uh, research has shown that working time reductions are ecologically beneficial. And in a way, Fridays for Future has been using a tool of the workers movement, the strike, um, and connecting it to ecological sustainability. Um, they've come up with the idea for a free day for future, um, for a, a free Friday for all. Um, wouldn't this make it a, a perfect theory um, to uh, build on and connect up the two movements? Yeah, I uh, already tried also to answer it in the like writing down because I think it's a really interesting question. And uh, since right now COVID and Corona is coming back right now in Germany, the uh, yeah people are getting even sicker and sicker. And uh, we're thinking about how to deal with this strike situation because I think they will not carry on any further so the strike will go down and the collective uh, moment might just pass and it might just end for this year um, but we have to think about what to do next year and 
um, next year there's going to be a really big um, yeah fight in the IG Metall. They have like the they call it M and E Metall and Electric uh, negotiation, which is the biggest one. They have uh, pushed it from this year to next year, and uh, yeah, it will affect I don't know how many workers, but a lot. And it's like the biggest strike strongest uh, sector and the IG Metall has like uh, Rachel said the four hour um, uh, the four days <laughs> four hour wow uh, four days uh, week work work week uh, on their agenda and I think it's something that we as the movement since we're talking about mobility change and public transport will have to get into too but we can't go and say like well then just let's build cars on four days and not five days we'll have to pick uh, I don't know a company that supports building buses and trains and try to get into a fight over there and show that we're not against metal working jobs we're just against the ones that build the SUVs we're just uh, right next to the people who are uh, fighting for for our job and um, for a week day job and uh, yeah maybe in a in a place where there are trains and buses built but next year will also be like the big election year in Germany so we have like I don't know eight elections in the departments and like uh, then the big Bundestagswahl which is uh, like the primary I don't know how to say that big, big election so Friday for future might just jump on that and uh, yeah, I don't know if they will pick up. Thanks, Katharina. Um, I have uh, another question from Ursula um, uh, saying that they're interested in the idea that renewables um, are less profitable um, or give lower uh, returns than fossil fuels. Uh, they are asking, can you please explain um, a bit more of an explanation about why this is the case? So I guess that's for, for Sean and, and Katharina. Yeah, Katrina, do you want to go first? Okay, um, here's the here's the reason why. I mean, first of all, the cost of re we're, I'm not arguing against renewable energy. I'm just arguing about energy choices should not be based on strictly on cost alone. But what we've done, what renewable energy is more expensive than it should be for a, a few reasons. One is the borrowing of money. Most, m most of the cost of renewable energy is not in, there's no fuel costs. You don't pay for wind and you don't pay for sun. The money, the cost comes in a number of forms, primarily the borrowing of capital. So if you borrow money at a high interest rate, which is usually, if you're a private company in a risky market, the risk was created by the neoliberal privatization, by the way. So if it had it been public, there, wouldn't have, there would have been a much more painless decarbonization transition in the power sector based on public need and not on essentially on cost. But you introduce risk and therefore interest rates are high. So companies who have to borrow money in order to do renewable energy have to recover those costs through the cost of electricity. So that is done through power purchase agreements, usually with governments. And these are, this is now the new auction system that was introduced in Europe and all over the world in the last six or seven years. So when, when this, what this means though, is that the existing power systems, nuclear, coal and gas have already basically paid for their infrastructure so they can produce electricity at a lower cost per kilowatt hour. And just as important, that electricity is available 24 hours a day seven days a week, 365 days a year. So the only way, so this electricity is, is cheaper than renewables, even though the costs of renewables are coming down largely because of the fall in interest rates globally. So that all sounds a little bit wonky, but the, the, where we land on this is the question of whether you're competitive or not is entirely superficial or should be. The question is what kind of energy does the world need in the decades ahead, how do we get to decarbonization? So when you hear renewables say, oh, well, we're competitive, they're actually not competitive, but it doesn't matter because if they were publicly owned, we would have less borrowing costs. We would be able to plan the transition 
the centralized generators in coal, gas, and nuclear would not be forced into losing market share, but would actually be part of a transition plan. And this is where the, the, uh, the torment of the market comes in. And, and um, you know, I, I want to just close by responding to what uh, Esther said. I think social dialogue in Europe has produced many positive outcomes and all credit to the unions um, affiliated to the ETUC and others around Europe who have who've pressed hard to defend workers' interests and pro pro uh, promote a decarbonization agenda. But we have to, if we're going to do social dialogue, we have to say to mainstream policy is accepted. This is public knowledge now that decarbonization targets are not compatible with competitive electricity markets and that we need a different framework. And this has got, there's got to be far more pushback. If we want to have a dialogue, we can't just let it be, and I'm not suggesting Esther is saying this, a comfort zone where we bargain on the periphery of the economy and not on the core pillars of economic life, which would include energy, transport, financial systems, and so on. So I think that is got to be part of it. Europe, the world has to face up to the fact that the, we cannot address climate needs, ecological needs, and social needs if we let basically the neoliberal project continue indefinitely. That's got to stop and we need to show how it can be uh, changed and uh, appeal to our members and the public uh, on the need to make those kind of radical changes. I'll stop there. Thank you, Sean. Um, I have a question about um, four day working week or 32 hour week um, and its relationship to Corbynism. Um, and obviously um, uh, the Labour Party in the UK lost the last election, um, uh, a good kind of eight, nine months ago now, or 10 months ago. Um, and, um, and a lot of the, the within the UK and, and, and a lot, with a lot of the world looking at the UK, um, uh, Labour were putting forward the clearest vision of, of the four-day working week, the 32-hour week. Um, this person is asking what, is, what has happened since then? Um, has, has that Labour election loss damaged the cause of the, of the working week? And, um, and, and what has happened since then in terms of the position of the four-day week, um, both in the UK, but um, also I'd be interested to hear from Esther across, across Europe. So that's that's for you as well, Rachel. I'm presuming Rachel's going to answer because it's a question about the 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 Labour Party in the in the UK and their and their strategy. Which um, but I'm happy to to pick up after. But the the thrust of the questions to Rachel. Um. Yeah. So I think. Uh, I so um. I guess I think yeah. I'm. Um, I would say I'm not 100% sure, and I think it's quite difficult to think about this because uh, because of how this year has panned out. Like we lost the election, sorry, Labour lost the election, and then two months later we're in like a go global pandemic crisis. And I think sometimes it's like quite hard to see how the what the impact of of um, of losing that election is when it's also kind of shrouded in this um, like strange time that we find ourselves in. I would say that I don't think I don't think it damaged um, the the uh, idea of four day week. Though I do think that um, having um, Labour commit to a four day week really opened like it got the idea out there, but it also opened it up to like loads of criticism from our very right wing press press and kind of pundits who wouldn't have necessarily talked about it before but that then can come on and say isn't this ridiculous like in the middle of a failing economy like Corbyn wants to you know let us all have a three-day weekend and the press in England is not um necessarily that uh well I don't know refined let's say um so I think it allowed it um for like kind of more criticism to to come out but I don't think it kind of damaged the the idea um, of a four day week completely. Um, as I kind of chatted about a bit in my 
in, in what I said earlier, I don't want to repeat myself too much, but I think um, in, some, in many ways, like the crisis, the kind of coronavirus crisis, the economic crisis that we find ourselves in has just forced, like it changed working overnight and has forced us to, to kind of question how we work and what we're doing and the economics of, of it all. And I think that that has allowed it to come back the four day week to enter back into the conversation in a much more positive light. Um, I think that potentially if it hadn't, you know, it, it, there was potential for it to just be tarred as this kind of like radical left wing Corbyn um, idea and kind of tied to Corbyn. But I think actually we've been able to kind of drag it back from that and kind of um, think about it as a solution to, to, to um, like, contemporary or current problems. Um, Esther, potentially might maybe have like a kind of more European wide view on, on that. So, so, so um, I think, I, I, I think that the reason I started with the Downton Abbey example is I think that it's useful to demonstrate that change is possible because to some extent people have started to think that changes in that, 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 that this is just the way things are and, and nothing's really going to change and and almost like that the current system that, that we're all living and working under is logical reasonable and common sense and everybody who has a different point of view about the way the world should be and the way it would should look and what what areas of work we should all do on what our relationship with working time should be that you're painted exactly as Rachel said, like some kind of a, of a crazy radical, like, 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 like out there. And I don't think we should be surprised about that because all of the media that people consume in their, from, from when they get up to when they go to bed, in no way challenges the existing system and promotes the idea of the individual as, a, as an entrepreneurial self, that you're supposed to sell your labor even to your employer, that, you know, that nobody owes you anything, you have to stand up on your own two feet. And um, like, like even if you if if you look at soap operas, it's always about people being entrepreneurs. You hardly ever see a positive representation, for example, of a trade union official. Hardly ever. You hardly ever see a positive representation of of a working environment that we all that we that we all appreciate so much, and, and we've come to appreciate just how much we appreciate it because of COVID, and we can't turn up at work anymore and hang out with our mates. So, 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 so that's my long-winded answer of saying we shouldn't underestimate the challenge that we're facing. And it needs to be broken up into, into uh, a set of realizable changes that people can see, here's how I fit into this. Here's, here's how I can take action in my workplace, in my union, in my community, and I fit into this. And this is what I can do. And this is, and this is when I when I do this. Here's a positive change, not only for me but also for um, the 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 economy and society. And I think that's the challenge that that we that that, that we're all facing is trying to find uh, a credible narrative that explains the justice of our case because the because the the, the economics have been shown, like 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 all of all of the researches you have here have can absolutely stand up the facts. So simply being right, we're not winning. And um, there's lots of good examples. Simply having good examples, we're not winning. So we need to we need to join forces. We need to find the things on which we agree. We need to find a way to encourage people to understand and believe that change is possible, but most importantly, how they fit into being an active agent in achieving that, that, that change. So I think that's why these, these discussions are important because they're, they're, they're opportunities to have a mosaic of solidarity and that what, we're each, what each and every one of us is doing is important in building up that, that, that mosaic of solidarity. And it comes as no surprise to any of you that I believe that the trade union movement is the force that can actually do this. Sometimes though we're like a tanker <laughs> you know, to, to get us to change course, it's not easy. Um, but you know, but that's why you know we need we need all of you turning up and showing up at, at union meetings and and making sure that that, that that people understand just just how how 
how much of a change could be achieved by reducing working hours. Thank you, Esther. And there's actually a, um, a, a neat follow-up to that question, um, uh, which I'll ask now, which is, um, uh, it's in relation to the eight hours movement, which was this international movement, which cut across, um, you know, various unions um, and countries. Um, and today, a lot of the, particularly the unions, um, it's quite, it's specific union focus, so whether it's Iga Metal um, or the CWU. Um, what, from your point of view, and I guess you're in a good position to, to answer this from your position, is um, what scope is there for a wider cross-union movement for um, uh, working time reduction? So at the ETUC Congress that was held in Vienna last year, we had included uh, for the mandate for this secretariat to um, open up a discussion with our affiliates on exactly that question. So, 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 so not only is the possibility of, of, of us coming to an outcome, it's, that's what's anticipated. So, 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 so we will need to report we say two and a half, three years from now to the next Congress to say, well, here's, here's how we considered this question and here's what we did uh, in relation to it. It sits on my desk and we are uh, discussing it within the ETUC Collective Bargaining Committee to look for a, a, a joined up collective bargaining strategy. I, I explained a little bit about, about, about that vision of using where we're strong. And that's why unions like uh, Iggy Metal are really, really important because, because if we want to get, um, if we want to lead by saying, well, this is the type of agreement, this is the blueprint for an agreement, you don't go to the, you don't go and try and negotiate that with a Ryanair, do you know? So, you, you know, like that you look at, you know, uh, uh, a strong union within uh, a responsible uh, industry relations environment. And um, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. Um, I think, I think, as I said, that with COVID is a moment. Um, people, there is a growing understanding within within all political, let's say, viewpoints that 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 the most vulnerable workers can't be the consequence of all of this. Can't be that they that that the, that we go back to the way things were before. That that um, that, that that exploitation has to be tackled. Um, and, and, the, and, and that the amount of hours that people have to work is part of that discussion, but it's, it's popping up in lots of different ways. But yeah, so, so I'm, I think that, yeah, we have the mandate to have a discussion. We're developing that discussion. Unions are bringing forward motions. There's already lots of activity, as you've heard during this conference. And so you, the ETUC now needs to bring that all together so that we have a clear set of uh, policy demands and to do that in a way um, that the that the that the that is like bottom up. It can't be like the ETUC telling everybody like you know here's what you all need to do. And um, as you know, that's not that's not that, that's that's never successful. It needs to be bottom up. It needs to be discussions. Um, and they are already on the agenda. We're we're already having initial discussions in our collective bargaining committee. That's really interesting to hear um, and really exciting and um, and I guess that's exactly what what the network is um, in many ways um, and it'd be lovely to con continue that conversation um, uh, with um, the unions with kind of broader civil society and it's certainly what the four day week campaign tries to do in the UK so it'd be lovely to chat more after after this about that. Um, we're getting towards the end of uh, this um, panel discussion now. Um, I'm going to give the opportunity to each of our speakers to, to kind of give a last word and you don't have to because we've already spoken a lot. Um, but if you do want to have a kind of a final word um, or a summary, um, then um, feel free to step up. Uh, Sean, would you like to would you like to say something at the end? Just thank you for putting this together. I spoke a lot and too quickly, so I'll, I'll stop there and it's great meeting some new faces and activists in the movement doing the work you're doing. Fantastic. Keep up the great work. Great. Thank you, Sean. It's great having you here as well. Um, Katerina. Yeah, thank you for having me. I uh, hope, I don't know, it sounds, sounds uh, a little bit if I'm too proud of myself. I don't know. Um, but I want to spread the word and maybe just push uh, this to all the other countries to find uh, unions and Fridays for Future to get together because I think the struggle is going to get harder and the fights, I don't know if you saw it in Germany right now, Verdi is 
uh, in a really big struggle against uh, yeah, the politics uh, because they want to cut uh, and not raise the, the wages of nurses even uh, in the crisis. So I think we truly have to get together. And I don't know, like Luisa Neubauer, who is the face of the Fridays for Future movement in Germany, her mother is a nurse. So I think we can't not see the connection between all of this. And uh, I think, uh, I hope this uh, will get beyond Germany and uh, will be an example for all the other countries too. Thank you, Katharina. Um, Rachel. Um, yeah, I'll take this time to just quickly respond to, I can see there's a question um, and I won't have time to type it out about the NHS. Um, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Um, like public sector and NHS uh, places being the first place trial for day week would be amazing. Um, I know that's something that we've kind of thought about having nurses on board in the past and you've kind of reignited my like um, memory of that. So I think that's maybe something we can take forward from this. Um, yeah, just thank you everyone. It's been really great to hear about um, all the different ways that, um, yeah, that people have been um, working to uh, like, deliver change um, and I think in particular what stood out for me was just how much um, collaboration between different groups of people and different unions was kind of a theme of this and I think that's something that yeah we should all think about um, how we take forward so thank you. Thanks so much Rachel um, and Esther do you have any final final words? Well I want to completely agree with, with Margaretta's comments in the chat which is the the two things which is that we capture and the moment of COVID and, and everything that we've learned and, 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 and with like the, 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 the public opinion behind that, but also that we, that, that, that we, that we use this experience uh, to build firmer foundations for the just transition um, and to, like, to, to combine them. I completely agree with that. And to end by saying, enjoy the weekend. Uh, what a perfect way to end it on. And thank you, Esther. And thank you to all our brilliant panelists um, for, for your talk today. It was greatly valued. Um, I am going to pass over to um, to Adrian, I think, who is um, doing the last uh, bit of this conference. Yes, thank you, Ellen. Uh, it was very great to, to have you from this round table. So yes, a little word of conclusion, and I um, will start to thank the people that uh, and been working with, with us to, to make this conference happen and uh, it was uh, very a collective uh, effort so um, uh, by uh, order so um, so yes Philip Frey um, you Aiden uh, first uh, for uh, the Music Link Foundation Will uh, Strong from Autonomy Alexandra Arstein from the, from the UK, uh, Philip Frey from the Center of Eman Emancipatory Technology Studies, uh, also from the support of the um, uh, Rosa Luxemburg Foundation from Brussels and from e also to, uh, to their support to organizing the conference and to Toril Dour, um, Amy Stodier from uh, ALDA of Iceland that uh, has been our technical host for today. So uh, thank you and thank you to all of our speakers. It was very great to have you and to, to for that. So thank you. Um, thank you for all, uh, all, all this great discussion. Uh, before I, I conclude, Margareta, uh, uh, can, you, can you put also uh, every, uh, every member of the team if, if it's possible? And uh, Margareta, uh, I will give you the floor for some few words and I will conclude and give you some information about the next project of the network. So Margareta, you have the floor to some word of conclusion if you want. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Adrien. Yes, I also have to thank to all our uh, contributors. It was for me really amazing that uh, we listened so from so different uh, points of view from trade unions, from uh, the Green New Deal people, from Fridays for Future, and from our scientists uh, on post-growth and so on. Um, 
all these different perspectives on the question of uh, working time reduction and uh, climate uh, crisis. I before did not uh, believe that it would go in this way uh, uh, together as it did. And um, I think we have a lot to, uh, yeah, let's say, uh, to, to have learned uh, by all these uh, discussions. Uh, first of all, that working time this, uh, reduction is really on the agenda uh, by Corona, but also uh, by campaigns uh, like the four uh, days week uh, campaign. Mm -hmm. And also um, uh, by the question of the climate and that um, all these uh, trials um, are uh, in the uh, in the frame of um, let's say on the one hand the knowledge now that we have to fight against the profit uh, maximization principle in all energy and industry sectors when we want to get uh, something like a green new deal and at the same time that we have to take the people uh, with us in um, in to, to to win them with the idea that the wealth today is not anymore the wealth of money or consume but more than ever the wealth of time and uh, i'm very happy that uh, uh, we maybe now still have also with that um, uh, widened our network somewhat i would invite everybody of you to uh, join us more uh, steadily and also to um, uh, uh, to connect with Aidan uh, for our newsletter, European newsletter on working time reduction. And uh, so I really, I'm very hopeful that we now, everybody of us will in his uh, uh, context um, uh, go ahead with this uh, joint uh, question of working time reduction and um, this fight against the climate crisis. Yes, many things. Okay. Thank you, Margareta. Uh, yes, uh, I would just to have some words uh, to, to, but you, you, you are saying the essential, uh, ah, sorry, essential things about it. So yes, thank you all for all this fruitful discussion and debate. Um, the, the, the goal of this, um, of this meeting, this conference was to give an overview of uh, some experimentation in Europe and to fulfill the, the goal of the network to connect uh, uh, to connect initiatives, to connect people, uh, and to make links between you. So uh, if you want to contact another and start working together, that is our goal, and we will be happy to help you with that and to welcome you, like Margarita said, in the network. So, um, and, but I think also the, the goal of this conference was also to allow us to explore the deep connection between working time reduction and climate change and climate issues. And, and, and we did it and um, the, all of the round table show the great opportunities, but also the challenges that we have ahead and we have to, to, to talk about it. But it was very inspiring and very motivating to do some action and to try to cons build something together. So I think this is um, quite positive. And the last round table uh, um, about the the example that we discussed about coalition and uh, uh, what has been shared by every speaker is what re really great to um, um, insight uh, our network and every one of us, every one of us, to develop the link between us to 
uh, um, try to build a campaign in our national, uh, uh, local uh, places where we live, when we are, and to do things so, and to have a, this um, mindset to create connection and ask to everyone to, to work together. So thank you for that. Um, just to conclude, um, some words about, about the network. So the next project of the network will be to continue the European newsletter. So I then put the, you uh, the link on the chat. Uh, thank you. And uh, so if you have uh, something you want to send to share, please, uh, you have his contact on the website. You can send it or to us. And we will, uh, this newsletter is sent every quarter. So basically the idea is to spread the world and share information. So we will continue that. We will also um, develop our, I think our next project will be to have a website, uh, own website for us to share information more broadly and more easily. So you can find the, also the minutes of, of the last conference. About the minutes, so uh, I have some question about the presentation. We diffuse the presentation uh, with the minutes of the of the conference, and we have been recorded the conference. But I, for now, maybe, but for now, we we'll have not um, we will not release the whole conference. But we we will make a short video of the highlights for each one table because we have a. One day and half of video is too long to, to, to short, but with the minutes, it would be easier and with the video to, go, to have uh, some uh, something to share on the... So you will receive it by email. Uh, this is, we, will be the last email we send you uh, um, uh, for the conference because uh, uh, to respect the, the RGPD and, uh, uh, and everything. So. You will get one email for us uh, with that information, the minutes, the video, maybe um, some links to and some contacts. And we are at your disposal. And um, also to finish, our next project will be a next meeting. Uh, that is very important for us. And um, so I think it will happen very soon, at the soonest as possible, uh, we can say and uh, to, to meet and if possible physically, uh, it would be good to see all of you in one room to, to, to discuss. And <laughs> uh, so that's our objective, our main objective, I think uh, for, for the next year. And um, as Margaret has said, we are happy to welcome you in the network, but the coordination team of the network is also open. If you want to help organize this meeting, uh, send us an email, it would be with pleasure. We are all volunteers, uh, and as the network is growing and growing, we need more, more, more human, human resource, uh, human people to help us uh, organize that. So basically, uh, I think uh, I have said uh, everything I wanted to send you, to for, to say to you. So thank you for your participation, your question it was very great, and I, I wish you a good weekend, uh, like uh, Esther said. So,